you want to kick us off, Dr. Balkin? Um, yeah, I just want to thank you, Katie, and um, RPK Group for holding this session. Um, I, I think there's been um, a lot of miscommunication, and you know, the challenge in, in this type of environment is always communication and, and trying to get to as large of a, a base with the accurate information as possible. And again, I greatly appreciate you providing an opportunity for um, our Erie community, um, college community to, to ask questions as well as anybody um, from you know, our region who has a vested interest in, in our success. So, you know, I know we had a strong steering committee team that included the county executive and, and others um, as we we're stepping through the process. Um, but, you know, as is always the case, there's, there's always going to be questions and um, potential, um, you know, issues with interpretation of data and all that kind of stuff. So, again, really appreciate you helping to address questions that might, might have uh, popped up over the past several months. Sure, no problem at all. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. And thank you to those that sent questions in advance or provided feedback over the last several weeks. Um, our, Mike, if you could just continue to let people in through the waiting room, I'll kind of ignore that cue. Um, so I'm gonna talk through some of our, well, first I'll kind of talk a little bit about the project and what some of our key findings were, since I think you know, not everyone got the chance to hear that firsthand from RPK. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'm just gonna go over some of the frequently asked questions. So there was a, a, a pretty significant number of questions that came in around the calculation of the faculty FTE, um, why we use the years of analysis that we used and sort of how COVID was impacted, um, both how COVID impacted the data and how data for COVID impacted years uh, was leveraged. So I'll go over some of that and then happy to take any additional questions that you all have. Um, I would just ask that folks are respectful. Um, don't talk over each other if you can avoid it. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat if you have them that you have written out um, and we'll just take them in the order that they come. If you do wanna come off mute and ask a question, just raise your hand and then we will call on you. Yeah, could, can I also just make one, one more comment? Um, you know, again, one of the things that I want everyone to recognize is that RPK group has made recommendations and have listed, you know, an executive summary of recommendations. Um, and those recommendations aren't all necessarily going to be implemented. You know, this is just based on, you know, the work that they did, the information that they had available, you know, and based on their experience doing similar assessments and studies with 200 plus other colleges, what they thought SUNY Erie should consider moving forward. And um, without a doubt, you know, this, this contributed to our decisions um, as far as what we had to do in short order to better position the college for future success. But, you know, this wasn't the handbook we followed. And, you know, we're obviously constantly trying to ensure that we're doing the right thing to position the college for great success moving forward. So, um, independent of, of what the specifics are that might be recommended. I just want everyone to recognize that the college and the board of trustees of the college are not just saying we're checking off, you know, we've done everything. There might be recommendations that we, for example, scrutinize programs that have significantly more students than, um, you know, people might think we should, should be worried about. But part of it is trend analysis work and you know, understanding whether or not programs are current, whether or not you know, there's demand for those programs. Um, and, and again, it really represents an opportunity for us to better focus on what we need to do to ensure that we're staying relevant and providing the best coursework and programs for our students. Um, and you know, for us to be offering things that don't result in, in jobs or easy transfer to, um, or ready transfer to four-year colleges um, is not why the college is here. You know, we're here to help have a positive impact on the, the Western New York region by contributing to, you know, the, the workforce readiness and ultimately the economy. So, you know, we, we all know this. I, I just wanted to frame it and, and again, uh, pass the, baton over to Katie and, and thank her. 
Great, thank you. Uh, so as you know, um, we started this project um, in the early part of 2020, or sorry, 2022, not 2020. Um, and we leveraged multiple data sources for this project. So I just had a couple of details here just so folks uh, kind of have some additional context. Um, we use data that was provided by SUNY BI, uh, the SUNY Area Office of Institutional Research, and SUNY HR. Um, there was additional, uh, I would say, like sort of qualitative or informational uh, data provided to us throughout the process, particularly as we tried to make sense of sort of what was happening across each campus. So we had a couple of different conversations or the ERI team had some conversations with folks um, beyond just the project team to get some additional context throughout the project. The years of analysis that you'll see in the slides and the final report um, covered uh, the academic year 2018 um, through the academic year 2020-21. Uh, most of the data that any sort of recommendation or analysis was, uh, was sort of based on was 2018 to 2020. 2021 data was provided for informational purposes, so it shows up in, in the graph that we present. Um, you can see it in, in multiple ways across the analysis, but for the most part, it was not utilized in developing any sort of recommendations. The only caveat I would say to that is related to the human resources data. We only had one year of HR data. So we only had 2021 because of your migration to Workday. So we did only, we were only able to present that one year of data in the analysis. Um, in terms of our key findings, again, if you've read the report, you've seen this, but just want to talk through them briefly. Um, we did find that enrollment was declining over the time period of our analysis. Again, we just focused on those four years. I did receive several questions related to, you know, looking beyond those four years, looking at longer term trends. That was not in the scope of our work. So we did just focus on those four years and we did see that enrollment was declining across those four years. But we saw that there were not um, similar adjustments to your course offerings, your facilities or your faculty to account for the change in student enrollment. Um, in most cases, um, we, we found that the college was operating as three distinct campuses in terms of course planning, course offerings, um, faculty utilization, even though there was duplication of programs across the, the, different the different campuses. So mainly speaking here to room for some better planning and efficient um, administration of the academic operations. Um, and that in general, there was a, a clear opportunity to adjust operations to student need. Um, which would then support better student outcomes, which we measured in this analysis um, by uh, uh, graduation completion. At a high level, our recommendations were to unify and right size the institution. So moving away from a, a, a system or a college that felt like it was a multi-campus and, and there were sort of and independent operations happening at each campus to more of a one college model with faculty and staff distributed based on student needs. And um, also to recommend eliminating programs that were not attracting a minimum of students. We also recommended reducing the physical footprint. Um, so we, do, we did not explicitly recommend to close South Campus entirely. Um, that was not an explicit recommendation. However, we do think that South Campus has a lot of excess capacity um, just based on the, the, again, the sort of size of the campus and, and the number of students who are being served on that campus and therefore recommended moving the home of the camp of all of your academic programs and departments to um, the other campuses, but still maintaining some kind of presence in the South Towns, whether that's at the South Campus or somewhere else we did not um, say. And then we also recommended focusing on student success. Um, so we, we did report on graduation rates and, and transfer and things like that. And there are lots of opportunities, I think, to continue to support students um, in a better way so that their outcomes are better at SUNY Erie moving forward. So the main question that got asked uh, many times over the last few weeks um, is, how, what is the difference kind of between the number of faculty that you know are in your department from a headcount perspective and the calculated full-time equivalent faculty that is in the report? So um, I'm showing on this, on the left-hand side of this slide, this is a description that's included on page 45 of the report that walks through how we calculated uh, full-time equivalency using contact hours. 
from your course activity. And then on the right hand side is showing that difference between um, the calculated FTE and the actual headcount. So as you can see for full time faculty, you have a lot more calculated FTE than you do headcount. And that's because a lot of faculty overload. So there's a lot of activity that's happening outside of your traditional load. So that is the main difference um, here. Any questions specific to the faculty FTE uh, calculation? I have a question. This is Dave Yusinski. So when using that calculated FTE faculty <clears throat> um, later in the report, you use that as the denominator of a metric that you call student credit hours per FTE faculty. And by not distinguishing overload versus part-time, you're lumping, you're kind of inflating that denominator number, which makes that metric uh, appear smaller. Am I correct in that observation? Um, I don't believe so. Um, I think that if, if faculty are overloading to the equivalency of a full-time load, you know, so as you can see, sort of in these numbers, you have more than 100 equivalencies of um, full-time faculty teaching an additional full-time load. Um, so it's like 100 extra people. I know that they're not paid at their, at their normal salary. I know that they're paid at an adjunct rate. Um, so you could think about the just adjunct faculty full time. So you could kind of just move that number if you want down to the part time faculty and add it to that FTE. It's the student credit hour per faculty FTE is inclusive of all of the FTE count. So it's inclusive of this um, sort of 554 number here. So if you, it is not just focusing on the full time, if that helps clarify. Yes. Any questions in the chat, Mike? There are a couple, Katie. Um, one regarding if RPK compared enrollment at SUNY Erie to other similar community colleges. Uh, let's come back to the, is there anything about the FTE? I'll come back to some of oh, those sorry. generic no, Nothing questions. about the okay. FTE right now other than Mr. Uzinski's submission. Okay, cool. Well, keep the questions coming. If you have them related to this FTE, I know that was a big point of uh, question. Oh. A late one just arriving, uh, a question that doesn't this demonstrate the efficiency of full-time faculty? Um, that is not my opinion on that. Uh, I think that based on what we, we see with some additional information, additional data, uh, we see that you have fairly small class sizes in some areas. Um, you're still, you know, in terms of are, are your classes running as full as they could be? What are your maximum capacities? So some of those other course metrics that help understand overall academic efficiency point to the fact that you're, you op, you're just offering a lot more stuff than you necessarily need to, depending on student demand. Um, and I think a lot of this in terms of the, the overloading and the faculty teaching more credits than, than they need to in their contract from a full-time perspective, um, actually points to the fact that there were just inefficiencies across the three campuses because you were offering things that at sometimes in two or three different locations, as opposed to just offering one, which was requiring faculty to, to teach beyond their contract. But I, I do fully acknowledge that is a, that is my personal uh, interpretation here. Yeah, if I might just comment, um, you know, a, a, a great example of that, and it's it's almost like an exaggerated example, is we actually had two campuses offering the exact same online class, and neither had more than like 18 people in it. Um, one had like six, the other had 16, I think. And, you know, rather than have two of the exact same online class being offered, it, you know, it it's obvious that we should only be offering it once for efficiency purposes. So again, you know, that's kind of like a, just an obvious case, but you know, it, it highlights the level of inefficiencies that, that we were experiencing. Michael? It did. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about like part, of, during the COVID few years that we had, Part of this report stated, especially in the tech and lab programs, that our sections were increasing with decreasing enrollment. We had to increase sections for social distancing. 
So we were going to have lower enrollment. And part of this lower enrollment over the years with the declining enrollment, did the RPK study take in consideration the demographics of Erie County? People that go to South Campus are coming from Wales, Arcade, you know, Angola. They're not going to drive to North Campus. So if South has eight students and North has 10 students offering the same section, that's our mission. Our mission of Erie County is to serve a diverse population. So that's not a, inefficient. That's our mission of the college is to service Erie County. Yeah, we did not look at student demographics, no. Thank you for your comment though. So, so let me just comment on that. And it's a great point. And it's one that's brought up continuously. And you know, I, I fully appreciate the consideration and the concern about the distance that students have to drive. And you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, the key consideration here is to ensure that this college is sustainable. And you know, as I've said in the press, and I'm you know more than willing to, you know, say again, you know, if I had my druthers, you know, I would love for us to have a branch of ECC connected to every McDonald's throughout Western New York, you know, that would be fantastic, but it's not financially viable. And, you know, whether they take classes at South or North or city, you know, we, we have to make sure first and foremost that this college is financially viable. And frankly, you know, it being that we were facing a $9 million operating deficit, um, we were not financially viable. I mean, that's that's all it comes down to. I'm not I'm not disagreeing with your your points. You know, I understand it's an inconvenience, but unfortunately, um, you know, if you just look at the demographics and the growth, um, you know, I had a meeting with a Lucian Banner yesterday, and they were showing me, just so you know, you're going to hit another cliff in another four years where it's going to drop even more significantly, which is driving us you know, strategically to be very focused on um, non-traditional students and trying to figure out how to best provide micro-credentials and distance learning. And, you know, the community college landscape is changing and we've got to be ahead of that curve. And, and you know, I, I, again, I fully appreciate your points. They're, they're, it's a tough discussion, but, you know, it, it doesn't change the fact that financially we have to be viable. Thank you, Dr. Balkan. The main, uh, the second question that we received a lot of is, is not unrelated to some of the points that have already been raised is related to the years of data. So I mentioned this briefly um, in the beginning, but uh, just reiterating here on this slide in some more detail, personnel data was used for 21 and for 20 and 21 because that was the only year of data that was available because of the workday migration that you all had gone through. Um, for 2021, for course and student data, it was presented, that year was presented for context, but was not used to inform any program uh, recommendation. Um, and then one of the questions I received uh, was related to uh, the location of courses. And so the four, the four locations we have in the course data were city campus, north campus, south campus, or what's called in your data internet, which refers to online sections. Um, it was noted that in 2020 and then sometimes in 2021, um, courses, a lot of courses were moved online. But if that, if that change wasn't reflected in the data in the sense of it didn't go back into the registrar's sort of course listing and make the change to say, well, technically this was taught at city by a city faculty member, but actually we, we moved the class online because of COVID, that change wasn't made in the data. We just don't know that change happened. So that's why you aren't, let's, I, I think some folks said like, oh, it looks like we taught all these courses in person in this year, but actually most of our classes were online. It's just a function of, of what the data um, says in the registration system. Um, so this is a slide from the report, slide 37. Um, and so this is showing just kind of that example here. So you did have some courses in the data for uh, that, that were indicated that they were online courses or taught at what is called the internet campus in the system. Um, but I fully understand that there were probably other courses that were taught at from city or north or south in 2020 or 2021 that did get moved online that is not reflected here. So 
can't change it because it's what the data says, but understand that point. So I wanted to just clarify that. All right, and the last uh, question uh, we received is uh, related to data sources. I'm not, that's certainly not the last question. It's the last of the frequently asked questions. We've received a lot more questions. Um, what data sources did RPK use for the analysis? So just again, reiterated here, uh, for your course data, we leverage SUNY BI. So um, every year the SUNY system or the SUNY ERI reports to the SUNY system, um, your course information, uh, so course enrollments, things like that. So we went to the SUNY system, to the, the BI, uh, SUNY BI program and pulled that data back. So we pulled that down um, from there. So it's, it's what the system already had. For program data, so student enrollment, student outcomes, all of that came from the Office of Institutional Research and your personnel data came from uh, human resources. The files have been made available to everyone who can sign on behind the single sign-on access. Um, so you can look at the raw data that we had for programs and courses and, and faculty. Um, we did uh, anonymize the faculty, so you hopefully can't tell like which person it is in the course data or in the faculty data. But for the most part, you should be able to replicate based on location um, and things like that. So if you, you know, take a look at that, let us know if you have any questions about access, but it should only be available to folks who can um, sign in with their URI credentials. Any questions about data access? Okay, well, um, that's all I have in terms of presentation. We did receive other questions, so I will, I'll stop sharing and address some of the questions that we're getting in the chat, which mirror a lot of the questions that were sent um, in advance as well. Um, so Mike, can you play the questioner here? Yes, I can, and thanks for those who've put questions in the chat. Um, as we indicated, we'll try to answer a lot of these right now, and as much as possible, try to group some uh, that are in similar themes. So there's a, a couple of questions related uh, to RPK's comparing of enrollment to other community colleges or trends nationally. And was that uh, was that done in this analysis? It was not done in this analysis. So our charge for this project was to just look at SUNY Erie. Uh, so we did not look at competitors. We did not benchmark you. We just looked at your internal operations and looked at a trend analysis for just you all because we were really focused on sustainable operations for you all as an institution uh, that I can so that's what we did with this project. I can speak to RPK's broader knowledge that that certainly what's happening at SUNY Erie is not unique to SUNY Erie in the sense that enrollments are declining everywhere. Um, but like Dr. Balkan said, that's it's a changing landscape for community colleges. And so every community college is having to do a lot of what you all are doing, which is trying to figure out how to best serve the students that you have, trying to reach new populations, trying to right size operations because of the decline that, that the industry has been experiencing overall. Yeah, I'd also like to highlight um, that one of the things that was unique is that although you know we did have changing staff and faculty levels over the past 10 years as enrollment has declined, it didn't keep pace with the level of enrollment decline. And it didn't keep pace with the level of actions that sister community colleges, even in the SUNY system, had taken in order to maintain financial viability. Right. Another uh, question, Katie, you're gonna group these two as well with, re with respect to um, the recommendations regarding South um, and kind of what might happen there should Erie uh, Community College take on those recommendations. Is there any research that shows a move towards a one campus model um, is preferred practice or best practice? Um, so our recommendation was a one college model, not a one campus model. Um, so we recommended more of a unification of your efforts and your planning across your, your multiple campuses. Um, so we are not necessarily, or we did not recommend in our report that you only operate out of one sole physical campus. We recommended that you unify your operation so that it operates more as a one college model. Meaning, you know, given the example that Dr. Falcon raised around um, offering, you know, similar courses on different campuses or similar courses online and sort of not catching some of that, those inefficiencies because course planning and um, course offerings are sort of being managed independently at each physical location. 
that is not best practice. Best practice would be to unify those efforts and, and you know, create a course offering um, and staff those courses effectively as one college, regardless of how many campuses you physically operate. Also, if I might chime in, you know, I, I also want to allay people's concerns about what we're trying to do at South Campus, because, you know, we have no plans to close South Campus. You know, we may ultimately get to the point where we say we want to reconfigure things to the point that the current facility and footprint doesn't make sense. And to that point, right now, all the work as far as students, you know, the, 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 the quantity of coursework and all that kind of stuff, we're currently projecting that we could use just two of the seven academic buildings at South and satisfy our current projected needs. Now that might change, might grow. You know, demographic information says, you know, the number of traditional students is declining faster in the South Downs than otherwhere, elsewhere but it doesn't preclude us from being able to grow non-traditional programs and opportunities in the South Towns area. But the reason I wanted to highlight that and the reason that we're doing some reconfiguration and changing you know, the, the space utilization at South, at North, at City is primarily to see if there's ways we can generate greater revenue from that space. To have dormant space that's not doing anything for the college is a drag on the college. And to that end, you know, we're in discussions already with several parties about how better to utilize that space, recognizing we're gonna maintain a presence in the existing South Campus location, but I've gotta figure out how to grow revenue. If we're not having students, we've gotta do something else. And, and that's what we're really trying to, trying to address in parallel with all the actions we're taking. Did you see Dave Yuzinski's hand raised, Dave? Hi, thank you. So maybe I'm reading this wrong or I'm a little confused. You were saying that the intent was not to create one college in terms of location, right? But then on pages 56, 57, and 58, you recommend home, well, 56 and 57, you recommend home campuses for certain majors. So aren't you essentially saying that these campus, like for example, city campus would be the home for like large majors such as general studies. And that major wouldn't be offered anywhere else. And so therefore, wouldn't that be actually making a one college campus? Like if you're in Erie County and you wanna be a general studies major at ECC, that you would have to go to city campus because no, none of the other campuses would actually offer that major. So you're creating three different colleges? Well, actually two, because there were no recommendations for South Campus. No, it, no. So that was more focused on, um, again, like synthesizing the operations of those particular programs and departments, because we found instances where um, you had similar programs or sometimes the exact same program and department on multiple campuses that were operating fully independently of one another. And so, there, you know, there were just again instances of people on South or City or North doing their course planning, you know, prepping to serve their students who came to them at that campus, and there were students who were going to in the same major at a different campus, and they were having a totally different experience because they had different faculty, different course schedule, you know, their their experience was different. So the recommendation of home is really more so to consolidate the efforts and the planning of the faculty and to create a home for those students so that you don't, um, so that while the like the home of the, the program might be at city, certainly courses could be offered at both if it's relevant and you know you have the demand for it for, for the student. But this is trying to get out of the instances that we observed of, again, the independent operations and planning that was happening for exact same disciplines, exact same programs at three or two different campuses. It was a unification effort. It, again, I mean, I think we made recommendations based on on volume of activity for the most part in terms of where the students were, uh, in terms of a home. But uh, I think the, regardless as, as Dr. Balkan said, as, as to how things like this get implemented or brought forward, uh, the intent is to create unity, is to create a reduction of duplication of effort that we notice happening at every campus.
And Erica, I see your hand up. Can you hear me? Okay, thanks. I put in headphones to make sure the background noise disappeared and I wasn't sure if it connected. Um, I wanna ask a question specifically about that efficiency um, as it relates to a one college model uh, and not a one campus model. Um, since you were looking at internal information from HR, from our IRAP department um, and from SUNY, why weren't um, departments and units maybe included in a discussion about that? Because I'm in the English unit and we do talk pretty regularly about how can we schedule efficiently? Maybe we need to be having more of those conversations, but I do feel like that's, that would have been something that might've given a bit more context to where we already are trying to kind of bridge that gap. And then where could we continue to do that? Yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, so we did speak to some faculty. Uh, we did have some faculty who were involved in our steering team meeting. Um, and so we did hear evidence of that, as you mentioned, Erica. So we're not, we, I think that's why we didn't say every single department or every single program is doing this thing. We didn't make that judgment, but we could see in the data that it was happening because of the instances of duplication that were just there in terms of course offerings. Um, so uh, we one we had a quick kind of a, qu a quick timeline to execute this project. Interviews were not part of our scope, not part of our process for this, um, and we felt like the data spoke for itself in the sense of of acknowledging some of that duplication. Not to say, like you said, there is really good work happening to unify already, and building on those those good practices will be important. Yeah, I, I also want everyone to recognize that. You know, we, we understand that our our faculty is the lifeblood of this college, you know, and to that point, that's exactly why, you know, the only faculty federation teaching uh, people who, who have had any kind of, you know, classroom experience have been library um, uh, personnel and, you know, mostly part-time library personnel. Um, so, you know, moving forward, you know, our interest is in ensuring that we're able to support the, the needs of our students. And, you know, when, when all is said and done, I, I don't know what this is gonna look like, you know, but I'll tell you, you know, we're critically dependent on our faculty helping us to not just enroll students and start classes, but have them persist you know, the challenge we have is, if, you know, if we had the same number of course sections, you know, coming up in the fall as we had a year ago in the fall, and all the students had persisted, we probably wouldn't be having a discussion at all right now. You know, if, if we had higher retention, you know, we'd be in so much better shape. But the challenge we have moving forward is the fact that our retention rates on average, and again, I say on average, are so low that unfortunately we have to almost have, you know, double the class expectation or enrollment in order to feel comfortable that yes, verily, it's a cost-effective course. And, and, you know, no one wants that. And I'll tell you, um, this is something that we as, as a group of educators have the ability to influence directly. And, you know, in my previous institution in Indiana, you know, there were faculty who had 90% retention. And, you know, those programs were thriving. And the key here is we've got to figure out together how to grow and enhance that retention. If we could increase it by just, you know, 10% each year for the next couple of years, let me tell you, we'd be, we'd be in phenomenal shape. So all that to say, you know, I'm, I'm right there with, you. you know, obviously we want to be able to support and serve our community as best as possible. And, you know, to that end, our faculty have to be very much involved with our students. And, you know, that means making sure that if they miss a class, we're figuring out how to follow up with them to find out why, you know, I, I hate to use the word coddle, but in some respects, a lot of a lot of our students don't necessarily have uh, the experience or the emotional intelligence or the maturity to know how to work through 
daily problems that they're probably going to have to work through when they get into the workforce. And we've got to figure out how to better assist them to, you know, not only help our retention, help our financials, but help the workforce development. You know, Western New York is competing with every other mid-sized city in the United States for population. And our success is going to help, candidly, our success will help draw inorganic growth. It will draw companies to the area when they see our success. So, you know, I, I talk about this all day long, but, you know, again, I, I'm very much focused on ensuring that we maintain a very strong educational expertise moving forward. Can I, can I ask something? Um, so as a faculty member and as a department chair, I take a little bit of exception with um, the fact that uh, faculty maybe isn't um, working hard to retain our current students or students that didn't come back. And I will tell you, and I can only speak for myself and I can only speak for business administration, but we bent over backwards so, to ensure yeah, that I mean, our students, well, I, I hang on, hang on, that our students, that our students that our students stay retained, okay? That they're engaged, that we check in on them. When they don't come to class, we spend extra time with them to make sure, you know, that they get the mental health, uh, mental, mental services that they need because there's those issues, that they get academic support that they need because there's those issues. Um, we actually, that's what we do best. And I would oh, love to hear, oh. I would love to hear some recommendations on maybe uh, some additional support and that we can get for that. So look, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna generalize and say what I'm talking about applies to every single faculty member in every department, every program. You know, obviously we have certain programs that are thriving and other programs that aren't doing as well. And, and again, you know, to, to generalize and suggest that what I'm saying is this is a universal issue. I apologize if that's the impression I get. But I'll tell you, you know, if you think that the 80-20 rule doesn't apply to colleges, you're wrong. Where effectively, you know, a large fraction of people may be doing it. But if we have 20% that aren't doing it right, we're in trouble. I mean, that's all it takes for us to be beyond the tipping point. We need everybody committed just as your business program is committed to trying to figure out how to do anything and everything possible to help our students be successful. And to that end, it's, you know, I love the stuff you're doing. You know, you're working with local businesses, you're helping them find jobs. You're, I mean, there's, there's so much that they need. And frankly, we need to support them in order for us to be successful and for them to ultimately be the alumni we want them to be. If you look around, the ECC alumni that are in the community and the impact they're having, it's staggering. I mean, I'm so excited to have a new vice president of marketing that just started a couple of weeks ago so that we can highlight the impact that our students are having, our graduates are having in this region. It's, it's outstanding, you know, it's unprecedented. And, you know, I, I, I apologize if I, if I misrepresented things, but I will tell you, you know, I think everyone can think of a faculty member who probably isn't carrying their weight. And I can tell you, I get emails directly from students about faculty who won't return their calls, who basically make students cry. I mean, it's crazy the stuff I get. And, you know, we're investigating. But again, please don't think, you know, I don't realize we have expertise that is doing the right thing, you know, but, but we, we just have to get everybody recognizing and owning that level of, of responsibility. So thank you for that. And, and again, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I understood your angst and your frustration because you know, my intention wasn't to poke everybody in the eye by any means. You know, I recognize there's a lot of fantastic faculty who are really bending over backwards and you know, have dedicated their lives to helping students change their, traje their trajectory. You know? And by the way, if you're doing it right, there's no greater occupation in the world. I mean, to be able to put your head on the pillow at night, knowing that you've changed somebody's life, you know, that, that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm so protective and wanting to be protective of our faculty moving forward. 
The last thing I want to do is put us in a position where we can't provide the service we want to provide. Yeah, I, I'm. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think if you look at some of the comments in the um, in the chat too, is is we we do have so many faculty that are that that is. I'd say that's 90% of what we do is support our students. And, and then we, we try to teach them too, you know, we, we care about them. We care about where they are mentally. We care about where they are in their life. And we know that they have a lot going on. Um, and, and now with things being cut so drastically and cut back dramatically, we need support. We need support to continue to help our students. So again, to that point, you know, we're, we're going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I mean, you know, I, we've got hard work ahead of us, you know, and we all have to step up and recognize the fact that how we did things previously might not be how we're going to do them moving forward. But, you know, it, it talks to the fact that a lot is changing. The demographics are changing. The requirements that local companies have is changing. The fact that you know a lot of companies and you know SUNY and Governor of New York, they're all pushing very hard to have micro credentials. And you know people worry, you know, is that going to be a competitive threat to our certificate and degree programs? You know, if we do micro credentials right, they're a pipeline for us, and that's how I want to drive this. You know, get somebody interested, get them so that they they can demonstrate to themselves that they can be successful. And then we got them on the hook. And then we draw them in, working with their employers to give them more opportunity. That's the future. You know, it's, it's completely different than it was five years ago, let alone two years ago. I mean, and, you know, I'll tell you, it, it's a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people who've been in academia for their entire careers to step back and realize that for whatever reason, because of COVID and primarily because employers have found that what's most important is their employees' competencies. They don't care if they've got a certificate, a bachelor's, a PhD. If they can deliver, they're important to the employer. And, and again, um, it's, it's, a, it's a radical change to what things used to be. You know, before people wouldn't even look at you unless you had a, a credential that you could share. Now, you know, it's, it's just a different animal and we've, we're going to have to work through it. I'm, I'm not going to tell you we've got this, you know, honed to a, a science, but, you know, we are all going to benefit by identifying more really good micro credentials that are help that are defined with the help of businesses and industry partners and, and employers. You know, it's not just pull stuff off the shelf. It's making sure that what we're doing is relevant and it's going to be impactful to the employer. So I've said all this before, but, you know, this is the team that's going to do it. You know, this is the organization, you know, this is the faculty set that is going to turn the tide for Western New York. You know, there's no other college of the 21 in Western New York that have the ability to impact employers as quickly and as, you know, significantly as, as soon a year. I sincerely believe that. So I know we are, um, we, this meeting is scheduled to go until one o'clock. Uh, we have, a, I can stay longer if folks have uh, more questions. So um, Michael, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question slash comment. If I could do two of them, sorry. Uh, one, SUNY OAR worked with the RPK group to help booster faculty adoption. And we know student enrollment appears to be the main factor for the functioning of the college. Has RPK provided any uh, recommendations to increase student enrollment? Because I would just like to make the comment, our enrollment management person at the college keeps on sending us weekly updates. Point in time comparison, we're projected to surpass our enrollment from uh, last year, and we haven't seen an enrollment increase in over a decade. So that, that's one. Is there any recommendations to boost enrollment? Because I would just like to say with all the cuts happening, we usually see 20% of our enrollment, at least in August. We have cut our support staff so drastically, it seems like we won't even be able to sustain that enrollment boost that we usually see. So I'm worried about that. All our support staff, you know, in admissions and registrar, 
if we have 3,000 people walking in the door, like in August, sometimes we do, we're not going to have the staff to be able to do that. Two, you said you didn't compare us to other colleges with enrollment declines and stuff like that. And especially with how you're calculating FTEs with that SCH number, you're just pitting departments in our own college against themselves. You're pitting smaller departments against larger departments, which, I mean, the basics of, you know, possibly eliminating a program, don't we have to look at the cost of how much that program costs and the cost of a campus? You know, if you're decreasing South Campus, what if South Campus costs less to run than City Campus? This doesn't make sense to close South. I mean, I don't want to close any campus, but are we looking at national trends so we're not pitting ourselves against ourselves? And are we looking at cost of each campus against itself if we're really going to say, let's maximize the efficiency of this institution? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. A lot, lot in there. Uh, so let me tackle the comparison question first. Um, so there is no national data set that compares faculty credit hours or production uh, relative within a department to other colleges and universities. There's no IPEDS required reporting at that level. So there is no way to say that SUNY Erie is teaching more credits per faculty FTE compared to another college that, uh, in, within a particular department or program that just doesn't exist nationally. Um, so, uh, okay, so, sorry to cut you off. That was sort of my concern. It's like, because if we're not comparing ourselves enrollment wise, it's like Monroe Community College just added another campus. They have seen enrollment decline, but they just added a campus and we're talking about decreasing ourselves and we're seeing enroll an enrollment increase for the first time. Other schools are building. Why are we going down? Everybody's oh, the same decline. Just to be clear, you know, our enrollment increase is still not covering, our projected enrollment increase is still not putting us on a level of student to employee ratio that's competitive. Even with what we're projecting, we had a phenomenal day last week or, or day, uh, day before yesterday, I think it was, with 250 people enrolled at North Campus alone. I think we had 60 at South or 70 at South. We had, you know, 90 or something at um, City. I, I, don't quote me on the numbers, but great numbers, right? And, um, but again, even with those numbers, we have not taken the action, over the required action. There's been action, but the required action to have competitive costs, you know? I mean, that's what it really comes down to. And I'll tell you, Monroe Community College does have their their ducks lined up. You know, they have been wildly successful. They have wildly impressive programs. They have new programs. You know, I was on their website yesterday looking at what programs they have. You know, they're one of the few in the state that offer an optics program, recognizing that optics is critical to advanced manufacturing. I mean, they have their their teams are coming up with really relevant, impactful programs and courses that are enabling them to really get the recruitment and the, the enrollment that they need. Uh, and and we, we have that opportunity, but, you know, we have to be sustainable and we have to rebuild. It's, you know, we're going to have to spend some time, you know, unfortunately it's not a light switch and we couldn't just continue on the path we were or we wouldn't have the college. Katie, just a couple of questions that we haven't got to that were in the chat. Um, two around um, what financial data RPK used um, to inform its analysis, if any financial data was used at all. Yeah, we uh, that was not part of our scope to look at the financial components. We were focused more on the course faculty and program information um, and also staffing for some of the administrative recommendations. And the second bucket of questions regarding around kind of methodology or future methodologies, we could talk about um, any analysis that was directly related to the library. And if this study is going to be extended to include stakeholder interviews or more qualitative elements. Uh, so I'll tackle the second one first. Um, there is no, there's no current plan for RPK to continue this study in any capacity. The final report that we issued is the final report. 
Um, so no to surveys and interviews. There's no plan for that. Um, in terms of the library, Mike, can you repeat that question or do you, can you, do you know the answer to that? Um, it certainly is an academic department. We recognize that within our analysis when we looked at faculty and courses, we then zeroed in our analysis to look at academic departments uh, that were responsible for offering degrees. Um, this is something I always look intentionally at. I'm a former librarian at a SUNY community college, so I pay particular attention to that. Certainly respect that there are librarians teaching in some capacities. When those appeared um, in the course analysis, they were mapped appropriately to the specific department that they happen to be teaching to if it wasn't a library specific class. Any other questions? Okay. Well, One in the there, chat okay. from Dave um, regarding any national or more um, intimate, maybe in New York State, um, multi-campus community colleges moving to, re to reduce or remove duplication of efforts, um, if there's any evidence that that works. He's specifically referencing SUNY Suffolk Community Colleges, um, which is in Long Island. Um, yeah, well, I think as Dr. Balkan has pointed out, you know, there what's happening at SUNY Erie, again, that's happening at many institutions, is that you have to react to a situation that was long in the making in the sense of sort of the, the financial situation that you find yourself in is a result of sort of not making adjustments over the last several years to account for the changes in enrollment that you've experienced. Um, I mean, I think consolidation and right sizing, all those things do prove to be fairly effective with implementation does matter though. So the way that you implement this will be important. Um, I can't point to like a gold perfect standard that I think will uh, give you the answer that you're looking for here, Dave. I don't know, Rick, um, if you have something off the top of your head, but um, in general, I think we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to realize the amount of savings that you all needed and, and hold your mission and values you know, as essentially as possible here. Well, you know, as a general framing, I think one thing I might add is very often in this work, the way we think of it is if you were to build Erie Community College today from scratch, given what we know, where we are, and our best sense of where we're going, would it look exactly the same? In every instance that I know in higher ed, the answer is no. That many of our structures and approaches, both from pedagogy logical perspective, as well as our physical presence and locations, uh, were built for a world that was perhaps 20 or 30 years in the past. They are not as responsive as where we might be going in higher ed. Dr. Balkan has talked about some of what that future might hold. Um, so I think there's just that fundamental reality of capacity and a more external look at how we respond to the market we serve. The wonderful thing about community colleges, you are all, of all the sectors in higher ed, the most responsive to that external environment. And now I think there's the opportunity and probably the need to make a bigger shift in order to be able to better match up with what students are asking us to do, what employers are asking us to do. Yeah, Dave. Thank you. Um, so another question I had in the report, so I'll, I'll deviate from the multi-campus thing. Um, so in your report, you had uh, recommendations for elimination of programs and monitoring programs with 30 or 60 majors and some rate you know, of, of admission or dec declination. But for majors that don't cost the college a lot of money, let me give you an example, the math major, right? Um, Let's say a student in Erie County wanted to start a DCC to, to pursue a math major, but along that path, they decide, wow, this is way more difficult than I thought it was. And then they end up, you know, changing majors or transferring or just doing something else at DCC. If we were to eliminate majors that really don't cost anything extra because there isn't that much additional coursework that's necessary, 
wouldn't we be losing those students who were who were reaching out maybe to ECC for options and then realizing that, hey, that path wasn't for me. Um, and I guess my question is why, why is, so that's one question. And the other question was, does the 30 hold for like all majors? Is it one size fit all? And I know you've done plenty of other, you know, college recommendations and reports. Um, is that 30 and 60 common? Like, do you have to have those numbers or, um, you know, or is it, is it actually palatable for students to look up how many majors we have and say, hey, I'd like to start here. Whoops, that was a, that was a missed up on my part. I didn't know what the expectations were. I guess I'll change majors to business or some other major um, that, that looks more conducive to what their skill set is. Yeah, so I can't speak to churn, which I think is what you're describing as students think they want something and they change their mind and, and they move around. Um, so I can't speak to that and I can't really speak to, um, at least from a, like, student demand perspective outside of the data that we have. So we know enrollment, that's what we have. Um, and so the 30 is really, the 30 number is really focused on like a, a generic class size. 30 is, you know, roughly like what you would think you can maintain courses for and fill courses for a, a cohort of 30 students. Um, so yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty common. Different states and institutions will set different cut points for their for their programs. Um, so it's really up to institutions. So we we think 30 is a, is the right number. Again, thinking about what kind of resourcing do you need to have to serve 30 majors? Can you fill courses effectively, efficiently um, with that many students? So that's why we chose that one. 60 from a monitoring perspective kind of just doubles that and says like, like what what do we need to be paying attention to? As you noted, we didn't just look at size, we also looked at growth trajectory. So it wasn't just, is it 30, but is it 30 and is it going down? Um, and if that's happening and you're not getting students to the finish line, if your degree production is not very good, I do think it raises a valid question as to like, do is this in the best interest of students? Even if it's not costing the institution a lot of money, it, it doesn't necessarily look very good to a student who, you know, students are, they have a lot more information these days around sort of the outcomes that they can expect with the different degree programs that are available. If you're not producing degrees in a particular area, I don't necessarily know that students are gonna, you know, point to it as, a, as an area of interest. Um, but even if it is a limited amount of resource investment in the program, which I can say because we didn't look at that particular piece of, of the puzzle, um, it's still some investment, it's still time, it's still energy, you know, getting the program listed, recruiting for students in that particular program, keeping the um, counselors and folks up to speed on all the different program offerings. There is still time invested that could be reallocated towards other programs. It's still faculty energy going into maintaining a program that could be put towards growing or uh, it, denying a new program. So there are things that aren't sort of quantifiable costs in that same way that go to maintaining such a vast portfolio that if you limited it or made some changes, um, you could realize some additional uh, kind of savings or, or time there as well. And Katie, just to build on that, this is Rick. You all have talked in the chat. I saw about the service providers internally at Erie. And I think that's another component that um, how do we better focus those services, particularly around student success, to a mix and a portfolio that better reflects the demand from students? That lets you better leverage those and can support you in actually increasing student success. So another way to think about better using the resources you already have, especially people and time. We're right at the hour. I imagine a lot of folks are gonna have to jump. Um, so Dr. Balkan, any kind of final comments that you'd like to make? No, I, I do wanna thank you again, Katie. And frankly, I wanna thank everybody who's on the call. Uh, you know, this is a critically important topic, you know, not just for the college, but for Western New York, you know, for all the industry partners and businesses in the area, you know, this is, this is hard work and I'll tell you, um, you know, the hardest work is still ahead of us. You know, I, I recognize that there's challenges. We're going to have challenges with doing things differently. People are concerned about how we're going to be able to support students in the exact same way. We're not going to support them in the exact same way. We've got to get creative and come up with new best practices for how to enable our students to be successful. And again, the practices that we're talking about, you know, they might be new to us, but they're not necessarily new to other colleges that have more competitive student-to-staff ratios or student-to-faculty 
employee ratios. So all that to say, um, you know, we don't do this lightly. You know, we understand what we're up against. And, you know, I also want everyone to be have their expectations properly set. You know, we've got hard work ahead of us. And I'm critically dependent on all of you stepping up. You know, I, I used the expression yesterday. You probably heard, you know, heroes aren't born, they're cornered. Well, you know, we came into a situation here six months ago. And um, frankly, you know, we're cornered. We've got to figure out how to keep this moving forward in the most viable, most impactful way possible. And it's, it's not me by myself. It's us. You know, we all have to step up and figure out how to take ownership for the student success, how to ensure that they don't wander away, how to wrap our arms around them and say, look, you know, over my dead body, you're, you're quitting this program. You know, I mean, we, we really got to figure out how to do some of the things I'm sure most of you are doing or mo many of you are doing. But, you know, it's it's, you know. <laughs> it's it's a it's going to be a, a tough road for a while. And I don't want anybody to think, you know, this was a one and done action. You know, we, we've got to continue to refine our processes, refine our strategy to ensure that we're we're having the greatest benefit to our students. We're relevant and we're having the po proper positive impact. So, again, Katie, I want to thank you. I want to thank RPK Group. Um, you know, we can do this. You know, we're we're in the throes of it. We're, we're making the change that's necessary. You know, it's a bit of a culture shift. You know, it's we, we all are going to have to do maybe a little bit more until we figure out best practices to make it easier. But again, this is doable. And the importance of our college to the area is too great for us all not to be stepping up and, and you know, effectively being heroes in this trying period. So again, this isn't going to happen without your support and your help. And, and I'm highly appreciative of everything you guys are doing. Thank you. As I, you know, we recorded this, um, we recorded this meeting. We will share the recording with the Erie folks and, and get that posted for you all. I imagine they'll post it in the same place where all the data is available. So you can share this with your colleagues if they weren't able to participate today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your careful review of the report. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about it with you today, and I hope you have a good rest of your Friday and a weekend. Yeah, have a good weekend, everyone. Bye.